This is the video for lab two, the density of a sucrose solution. So for this lab, you're going to be making a sucrose solution, which is just sugar. You're going to be making a solution of a specific mass percent. Then, after you have made the solution, you're going to evaluate its density, and then you're going to look at the percent error of that density solution, of the density of your solution, by comparing it to published values. So before you can really do this lab, we need to talk about what is mass percent. Now, in unit or chapter three, um, you're going to talk about a lot of different values of concentration. But in all honesty, you're probably not there yet. And that's OK. Concentration is generally just a way of describing how much of something is in a solution. Now, visually, you can kind of imagine um, Maybe the easiest way would be if you were trying to uh, color a sign for a garage sale. You could kind of go like this, and there's purple in this area. But if you add more ink, it suddenly becomes more purple, right? That's just a very visual way to view it. You could also think about it in terms of cupcakes or something like that, where if you wanted to make icing that was, I don't know, brilliant orange, you could add a little bit of food coloring, and it's going to start turning orange. It may not turn really, really orange until you dump in the food coloring. Perhaps a, um, a more common way to view this would be uh, with something like the new Mio drink um, or other flavored beverages, where they say you can add a little or you can add a lot. If you want a little bit of flavor, you add a little. If you suddenly want maybe this to be very, very... I don't know what color, what flavor is blue, raspberry? You wanted it to be stronger, you would add in more. And so it's a very similar concept here. It's just the amount of our sucrose or of an analyte in a solution itself. So let's look at mass percent. We're going to evaluate what mass percent really means and how you can do the math for this. And then we'll get into talking about density, how you're going to calculate percent error, and then what you need to do to make sure you get full credit for graphing. So that's kind of what concentration is. Just keep in mind, it's just a way of viewing how much is in your solution. Now for us, you're going to have clear, colorless water, and you're going to be adding in white crystals. Well, if you've ever dissolved sugar in a beverage, um, it disappears. It turns colorless as well, and so it blends in. There's not really a very easy way visually to see this, and so what you're going to do, since we can't quantitatively determine it by sight, is we are going to measure it on a scale and add it that way. In a lab in 112, you will actually visually determine how much is present using a spectrophotometer, but that's for later. So you're going to weigh out some amount of sugar, and you're going to add that to some water. Um, or actually, you're going to add the water to the sugar. But the idea is you want to know approximately how much you're adding. So what we're going to do is we're going to use mass percent. Mass percent, in your textbook, sometimes they call it WW like that, meaning the weight of your analyte per weight solution. Mass percent is going to be the mass of the solute over the mass of your solution times 100. The solute is just what is dissolved. So for us, that's our sucrose. So for example, if you wanted to have a 15% mass percent solution, that means that for every 100 grams, you'd have to dissolve some grams of, this is of our solution, you'd have to dissolve some number of grams of sucrose. And so you could solve this and figure out you'd need 15 grams of your sucrose. So in lab, you would put your beaker on the scale. There's your scale. You can tell I'm an artist. Um, you tear it so that it says zero. And then you're going to add in the sucrose until you have 15 grams of crystals down here. Then what you're going to do is you're going to use your DI water 
and you're going to spray in until you have another a total of 100 grams in here. So you'd have 15 grams of your sucrose here, 100 grams of your solution, 15 divided by 100 times the 100% gives you 15%. So for us, we are going to have an assigned percentage or assigned mass percent per group. Now, the mass percents you get are going to be between probably about 5 and 15 percent. If you have less than 5 percent, it gets to be where it's really hard to do the next part of the lab and it's just not as much fun. If you have higher than 15 percent, it takes a long time for that sugar to dissolve and that's also not fun. You're sitting there stirring for 30 minutes. So you're going to figure out how much you need to make or how much sucrose you're going to need to weigh out to make your solution. And it's going to be just like this. We're going to tell you 15% and you know you're going to make 100 grams. So you're going to put your mass percent here, the 100 grams here, and you're going to solve for this x value. Now, once you have that sucrose solution, you know roughly what mass percent it is. It's really hard to tell if you've got it right on or not until you evaluate the density. Now we know a theoretical density for different sucrose solutions, okay? And so the idea here is that you are going to calculate the density of your solution to find out how accurate it is. Now, the first thing you're going to look at is um, let's see, we need a graduated cylinder. There we go. So you're going to have your sucrose solution and it's going to be sitting off to the side with a nice label because uh, we're at TCC. And so you're going to write out everything you need to do on that. Um, so you need your name, the fact that it's sucrose, the percentage, and um, the date. Now, um, in order to find density, remember that density is grams per milliliter. Okay? So we're going to have to figure out exactly how many grams and how many mils we have for our sucrose solution or our samples of sucrose solution. This is problematic for a few different reasons. First, this volume may or may not be accurate. You have these graduated cylinders. And in lab one, we tell you graduated cylinders are much better than beakers. And they are, but they're not exactly perfect. So you're going to calibrate the volume of your graduated cylinder by evaluating uh, how much is there. So what you're going to do is you're going to fill this exactly to 10.0 with water. And you're going to measure it on a scale it's going to give you some number of grams. The problem here is that the density of water can change with temperature. It is um, temperature dependent. Now technically it doesn't change by that much, but it does change. And so you're going to take the grams of your water and you're going to use the density from table one at the t uh, temperature of the lab. And so say, for example, I need to look up the density of, OK. So say, for example, for you, you've measured out exactly 10.0 milliliters, according to your graduated cylinder. You're going to transfer this to a teared beaker. So now you have your 10 milliliters here. The lab is going to be 20.5 degrees. Uh, it's probably not. You should check the temperature when you're in lab. Um, that's fairly chilly. I doubt it'll be that cold. Um, now at 20.5 degrees, the density of water, according to the table, is 0 0.99809 grams per milliliter. That's the density of water. So you now have, you put it on the scale, and maybe you get 10.01 grams. 
So you're going to take the 10.01 grams of water using the density from table 1. You're going to say, well, every time we have 0 0.9989 grams of water, we get 1 milliliter. So now our grams of water are going to cancel, and we have 10.01 divided by 0.9989. Our graduated cylinder didn't actually deliver 10.0 milliliters. It actually delivered 10.02 milliliters. Okay? So you're going to do this five times. You're going to get a mass of water. You're going to use the density of water at the, at the temperature the lab is in to find your milliliters. You're going to do that five times, and you're going to get an average volume in Part B. That B, Part B, gives you the calibrated volume that you're going to be delivering, okay? And so what you're going to do is you're going to take that volume, uh, we'll go like this, and say for part C, you're going to measure out 10.0 milliliters according to your graduated cylinder, which is really going to be equal to the calibrated volume because you calibrated the 10 mils to find out that maybe your graduated cylinder delivered this. So you're going to measure out 10 milliliters. You're going to add it to the scale, and it's going to give you some mass. So maybe you had 11.21 grams. So now you have the mass of your sucrose solution, and you have the volume, because we have this calibrated volume, so to find density, you're just going to divide grams by volume. So you're, for us, our volume was 10.02. You're going to use that calibrated volume for every single trial. And you're going to put your mass of that sucrose solution here. And we would have, assuming this was what you get, 11.21 divided by 10.02. And you get something like 1.19% uh, grams per milliliter, sorry, grams per milliliter. Um, that is how you do Part C. You're going to have the mass from your scale. You're going to have the volume from par the previous part, Part B. And you're just going to divide. And the end of your five trials here, you're going to get an average density. Now. It's great that you have a density for your solution. However, we want to know if it's accurate. Um, and the way that we're going to measure that is by looking at percent error. Okay? So percent error is just taking the true value or the theoretical value. I think we call it theoretical, don't we, in lab? We call it... the experimental minus the theoretical. So I was wrong. Too many textbooks. So according to your lab, it all means the same thing. You're going to have an experimental value. This is the density value you get in part C. And you're going to have a theoretical value. This is the density value that comes from table 2. So you're going to look at the mass percent of your solution and the density that you should have had in theory. And you're going to subtract them. And then you're going to divide by the theoretical value. And multiply by 100 because that's what you do uh, for percent. There's my 100. Um, so say, for example, we, in theory, should have had 1.102. Uh, That's a value in the table. Maybe if we made the 22.5% solution. So for our solution, we should have had a... Ma uh, density of 1.102 
grams per milliliter. But instead, experimentally, we got 1.18. That's a really high value, but that's okay. Grams per milliliter. So we're going to take our experimental. We're going to subtract our uh, theoretical. And then we're going to divide by that theoretical and multiply by 100. So for us, what that is going to give us in our calculator is 1.18 minus the 1.102. Oops. Calculator error. 1.18 minus 1.102 divided by that theoretical value of 1.102 from table 2. And we're going to multiply by 100. And we get something like 7.08% error. That's actually not bad. To be honest, guys, most of the time, your instructor is not going to care how big or how small that percent error is going to be. Um, we get kind of doubtful when it approaches 0. And we get kind of doubtful if it approaches something like 50 or higher. We don't really care how big the value is. Go away. We just want to know that you can calculate it correctly. So as long as you know that this value, the experimental density, comes from part C, oops, and the theoretical value comes from table 2 for the per mass percent of your solution, um, we're pretty happy. You show us that calculation, we're, we're fine. It doesn't have to be at zero. It doesn't have to be this small. Honestly, this is a really small um, error. Most students will be uh, probably a little bit higher than that. So that's how you're going to do the math for this lab. But then the very last thing you do is for part D, you actually graph it. So you find the density in part C mathematically, and then you find the density in part D by graphing it. Um, and it's just a different way of handling the data. Uh, so you're going to have your mass, you're going to have your volume. Now, in general, for part C, you just uh, tear the beaker, you get your mass, no problem. For part D, we tell you not to tear it. And so you're really going to have larger masses because you're going to have the mass of the beaker mixed in here. That's okay. Um, so where's the new table that I had? Oh well. Um, but the big point is you're going to graph this data. Make sure you are not subtracting the beaker from it when you graph in part D. We want your y-intercept to be roughly what the beaker's mass is. So let's just, um, I'm just going to add 50 to all of these to kind of prove my point. So it's really something like that. So you're going to come into lab and you're going to get a, um, uh, what's this called, piece of graphing area, we'll call it that, uh, where you can graph your data. And so the idea isn't to start here at 0, 0.0 and go up from there. You want your data to maximize the amount of space. So since my data here starts at something like 60, maybe I'd start this, or this is 61. Um, and this, and now because our slope, hopefully this is not uh, too much of a, too uh, unfamiliar y equals mx plus b, right? Our, we want our slope to be our density, which is in grams per milliliter. And slope is always rise over run, which means we want rise, or y-axis, to be grams. And we want our volume to be down here. Now, you want to have both the unit and the title here. So it's not just mass, it's mass in grams. It's not just volume, it's volume in milliliters. So because my mass is um, 61 is the lowest, maybe I start here at 60. And it goes up to about 95. 
So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Mm, I can probably do 5 mil increments. So this would be 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 60, 70, uh, let's do 80, 90, and 100. And I probably still could have made it a little bit better. But you can see like it's occupying more than three-fourths of the area if I do it this way, as opposed to sitting all in one little area. Now on this way, we have it going from 10 to 40. So I'm going to start here at 10, or 10.01, uh, 20, 30, 40, that's good enough. Um, you could probably extend it a little bit if you wanted to do increments of 7 or 8, but I don't want you to be here that long. But you want it to occupy the whole area. So this is not what you want. You have all this empty space. That's bad. You want it to look more like this. That's kind of what uh, I wanted to show you. Um, so you're going to have lots of grid points. It should be large and all overall. So when you're doing this, guys, remember that you want your volume in milliliters down here, your mass in grams over here. And this should always be named y versus x. So it should be mass versus volume. Don't name it density. Don't name it part d. Name it mathematically correct. When you do that, you'll be able to find your line of best fit. Remember, it's rise over run. If you need to look up how to do that, y2 minus y1, x2 over x minus x1, you can get your different slopes. Um, make sure when you get that density, that slope, or your density, you're considering what that means mathematically. Hopefully this helps you see um, what you're going to do with your data and how you're going to treat it.